this record that you worked on, you're mm. working on right now, has been explained to me, and you can let me know if this is it correct. Is that this is a kind of a cohesive body of songs that were originally composed at a certain period? Is it was it after maybe Eternal Years that around that era? And um, it's almost like a time capsule of material that you've kind of revisited. It um, it, it it it's a a broader time period than that. It, mm. it, the earliest bits and pieces because not every song on this album was a completed song there are some things where they're they're, they're, they're sort of composites of a couple of different songs or I've used a segment of something that I'd written at that time that I didn't really know what else to do with I, I do tend to write in bits and pieces a lot of the time and mm -hmm. So the, the time period this covers is probably, it's a 10 year time period from about 1969 to 1979. Wow. So it's pre-Saints wow. when I was starting to get really, I, I mean, one of the... Are we talking lyrically and musically or mostly musically? Mostly music, there's a couple of lyrics, yeah, uh, which, which I've done nothing to, even though they could probably be vastly improved, but I've just yeah. decided to leave them as they are. Oh, that's cool. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it's a, it, it, it is both pre-Saints and there's a, a slightly sort of nebulous period just as the Saints uh, were splitting up and just prior to, I had the idea for Laughing Clowns, but the band wasn't quite together. But a lot of the material that I was writing, you know, had the Saints not split at that time, would have been Saints songs as opposed to Clown songs. Right, yeah. right. When you think of these songs, like, would you, like a particular song, do you associate it with like a physical place? Like, can you remember like, okay, for example, Red Aces, like does it, call to mind like a certain physical place that you were in when you wrote it like your bedroom at your parents house or wherever you were working in London at that time yeah no that was actually a bedroom in my parents house it was in it fact was, yeah 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 the bulk of the song the horn part was my flat in London right so that was sort of an add-on and um but the the basic song you yeah, know I actually remember it quite well, a, a Brisbane winter. talk a bit about Goodnight Ladies as a song too because like the it seems like there's the beginning part of the song which has almost a I think of it it's it's similar in some ways to like a song like Nights in Venice where it's like an endurance groove you know where the mm. groove is just so mighty and relentless and then but like as you say then it has these other sections that appear towards and was that initial groove section is that something that when what era would that have been composed? That, that is kind of it's uh, a Nights in Venice Era. Sister, it's it's yeah. one of one of the earliest things we did. A number of pieces that were kind of based around getting a a feel going, yeah. and then uh, I guess they, the the others kind of just got lost, or because when we did the first album and recorded Nights in Venice, I think everybody just well certainly I did. I won't speak for the others, but. Mm. I just thought, well, we, we, we've, we've done it all there. Right. You know, it's five and a half minutes. Yeah. What, what else do we need to add to it <laughs> in a way? And, right. and the, the first album for me was always, you know, most people see that as the start of the band. I see that as the finish of the, the, yeah. the Brisbane era of the Saints. After that album, we changed. We needed to, you know, we, I, I, 
because it was the culmination of a bunch of ideas that you'd had yeah, for many yeah, years, yeah. and you finally got the chance to express them. That, that, that's it, yeah. exactly. And so, anything that was kind of too similar to songs on that album mm -hmm. also got left off. Right. You know, which is why they didn't end up on later records. Right. But we're now dragging, dragging through the <laughs> through the swamp of castaways and and putting them onto this new record. But. Um, but it's with and with thrilling results. I have to say, like that track, "Good Night Ladies." I it's think like it's, it's, it's you know I needed yeah. a little bit of time between drinks in a while. <laughs> so Forty years. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, this is all right. <laughs> So is Country Song and G from what era would that song that be? That is uh, Prehistoric Sounds outtake. So okay. it has a, well not an outtake because it didn't actually ever get recorded, but um, it's it's from that group of songs. So, um, uh, what, what else is on there? This time, it, it, it's Chameleon, a, yeah, they're Prisoner. Kind of, yeah, they're kind of blurred because of the, the time period that was, you know, we. I, I call it a, uh, a North London flat. It's one of the songs from that era, sort of yeah. thing. So very briefly, after, shortly after we finished Eternally Yours, it probably December, December 1977 song, I think. So wintertime London. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but a sunny day. I could not tell myself away things I had to say So what's the to maybe describe the personnel on this record? Well we'll start with the keyboard yeah. so, um, that's Alistair Spence um, who's sort of quite a uh, an accomplished uh, jazz pianist really mm. um, a, that that's kind of his area of um, expertise and so it, it's great to have somebody with that sort of aesthetic into it because one thing that I, I thought was sort of would be a nice thing to do is to link those the, the saints and the clowns and so that I'm not doing it with horns so much I'm actually doing it with something else to give it a a, a slightly different coloration, I suppose. It would have been an obvious thing. Might have been to sort of have the the horns taking that role, but I, I kind of pulled the horns back into more of a supportive thing, mm. and the piano kind of takes the um, the function of what the sax did for a little bit in the clowns. Yeah. Um, then there's um, Paul Larson on drums. Paul has been playing drums for. A long time. Um, it plays with the Celibate Rifles and mm -hmm. uh, the the New Cries, um, possibly some other bands that I am not aware of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's um, what can I say about Paul? He's you know, rock solid. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, uh, Peter Oxley playing bass. Uh, Peter has worked with me in a number of different situations over the years but is probably better known for the Sunny Boys um, mm. and then yeah Eamon Dilworth doing the the trumpet he's the sort of leader of our horn section mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's he's great he's uh, I love working with him because I will just hum him a horn line and he just notates it in two seconds whereas it would probably take me about half an hour to do the same thing so mm -hmm. he's top guy yeah <laughs> we were talking um earlier about um about the manner of recording the record and how um you wanted to remain true to the impulse of the material without getting into some retro nostalgic kind of coffin or something like that. But yeah. that you, but 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 like for example, the record has been recorded analog, um, yeah. and 
um, using gear that would have been appropriate to use on the thing. And, and just from the track I heard, there is a certain, like, it does it has no feeling of like that you know it's like you know like someone's trying to be a rockabilly man or something like that but it has yeah. this freshness but at the same time it the material is united to the sound in a way that seems very satisfying what was important to me to make to make sense of the material was to try and a- achieve uh, an element of the sound quality that you get from using certain equipment rather than um, you know going out of our way to sort of play in a particular way and I think doing this this recording in in a completely analog way um, helps achieve that down to the way that we've mixed it um, it's a it's a non automated desk so all the moves are manual there's there's nothing that can be saved you can never repeat it sort of thing so one mix is that mix um which is so a commitment to the moment of the mix right yeah, so it's like yeah which is yeah. which is what happened on all of those old records we, right. they were all done on desks that weren't automated they were all sort of whatever moves had to be made were made and most likely they would never be made exactly the same way again if you didn't get a good mix down sort of thing so right. we've done that it's called church of simultaneous existence that's right is yeah. it a schism or a sect of the church of indifference or there it's it it's a it sort of comes from the same the, the, the two strands of, of the, the same period of time. Um, the, originally, the Church of Simultaneous Existence was going to be a, a short story. Uh-huh. And um, it, I just felt it overlapped with Church of Indifference too much to make it a song at the time. But once again, you know, 40 years down the track, well, yeah. it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. But those are exactly the kind of threads and stuff that I find fascinating, you know, because they speak to like an, an, a, a unique creative process that has these things that cycle back and exactly like we were talking about. Yeah. Well, I, I also thought that the idea for the story kind of worked really well with what we're doing here mm. because this is a sort of a hypothetical situation. At one point, we were debating would this actually be the sort of the unrecorded, long lost Fourth Saints album or is this actually the debut Ain'ts album. Right. And it's both. So <laughs> That's very cool. Mm.